Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Okay. Yesterday was charge conference. Back in the day, it didn't used to be called charge conference. Does anyone happen to know what charge conference used to be called? It used to be called quarterly conference. By quarterly, it means meets four times a year. <laughs> Judy's shaking her head. She's, I don't want to do. I don't want to do charge conference four times a year. In the Methodist tradition, we have these weird names like annual conference, where it's that combination of a time frame, annual conference, quarterly conference, right? General conference is the quadrennial conference, happens every four years. And the idea behind this, which comes out of our history, is that the smaller of a region that you're looking at, the easier it is to gather, and so the more frequently you do it. So a pastoral charge, which back in the 1920s actually looked a lot more like what we're calling a cooperative parish today. You have one elder, you know, appointed to a church and overseeing a bunch of different uh, licensed preachers and some lay ministers and some deacons and quarterly everyone the all the lay leadership and all the clergy people and the retired clergy in that pastoral charge would come together to review the total mission and ministry of the charge that's the phrase from our book of discipline to review the total mission and ministry of the charge and that's what we were doing. That's what we've been doing with these reports the last couple months that we've been working on them. That's what we're doing, coming together with the bishop there, with our other churches. It's trying to look at the total collective mission of the United Methodist Church in the Great Plains region. But conferencing, these conferences, are also really important to us historically. And they didn't used to look like what we often have them look like today. Back on the frontier, Methodists were really weird in that we really wanted to come together. We needed to come together to do our business of the church, yes, but also for revival. And so the quarterly conference was an opportunity for everyone to come together and they would meet outside, which was weird back then. They would go out into a field, or they would go out into the woods, and they would pitch tents, and they would be there for three or four days. And if you're gonna be there for three or four days, well, there aren't, isn't just like a McDonald's you can pop over to when you get a little bit hungry. So you need to pack your bags, and your, get your horse ready, and your wagon, and you're bringing your family, and you're, you're coming prepared, and for days, two, three, four days from sunup to sundown, there would just be all the different preachers preaching one after another. And every time people would eat, they would come together and it would be a love feast, it would be communion. And you would have just this spiritual revival, this focus on the evangelism <laughs> for days. And then at the very end, the very end, for an afternoon, the business of the charge would be conducted. People would be nominated and elected to positions. People would be commissioned to preach. And that's kind of what happened yesterday. We, we had about two hours focused on the, we had a little bit of worship. We had a little bit of preaching. We had some singing. We had a little community organizing activity. And it was only in about the last 30 minutes that we ran through the business of the church. I'll give you that history just because I like history and because my hope is that as we continue to move forward together in these next few years, charge conference 
we might be able to reclaim something of that holy conferencing, which is an idea from John Wesley that conferencing, coming together intentionally, is a means of grace in the same way that communion is a means of grace. That it is, in fact, good to be together beyond the walls of just this church. It is a good and beautiful thing when Methodists come together, especially across the pretty radical diversity that we have represented in our cooperative parish. But you know, I've spent all week trying to get ready for charge conference, a little bit more than all week, really. Uh, we've been trying to plan this for a while, and you know, I thought, I thought we had everything pretty much in order until District Superintendent Law surprised me. And those of you who were there, uh, I think you were probably surprised too. It was during his greeting, and he started to tell a story about a lay person that he had met in the district. And he started to tell this story about this lay person in the district who used to sell, or he used to do collections for a cable company. And I start, and I was listening, and about 10 seconds in, I just looked back at Jackie and I said, he's talking about Bramer, right? And Jackie said, yeah. And about 10 seconds later, I realized, oh yeah, I was there. <laughs> I was there when Gramer told District Superintendent Law this story. And here's the story in brief, which is that Gramer used to do collections for uh, Time Warner when people didn't pay their bill. And sometimes this took him down into some of the sketchier locations, maybe not always the safest. And one of the things that Gramer had shared with us was that he had noticed that some of these families had kind of rather extended cable packages. They didn't just have the basic package, they had HBO and the sports channels and the additional stuff. And so he was wondering to himself, I mean, why is it that these folks who are not super well off, you know, they're not even able to pay the bill, they're late on the bill, why do they have such an expensive package? And rather than making assumptions, Raymer at one point just asked somebody, and the mother said, well, it's dangerous outside, and if I have this, these extra channels, if I have this bigger cable package, then my kids are more likely to stay home and stay inside where it's safe. And I can watch over them and they can be entertained and they'll be safe. I just want my kids to be safe. And I think that's a great anecdote on its own. Kramer was preaching to our district superintendent. I don't even think he meant to, he didn't know he was. But what I was surprised by, the reason I was surprised and so blessed to hear this happen was because that never would have happened. That event, that moment never would have happened if I wasn't a district trustee and hadn't needed to go fix his house and bring a roofer along who Gramer knew the roofer and I also needed Gramer to come along because I don't speak Spanish yet, and the roofer didn't really speak English. And so Gramer and I were there at the district superintendent's house at his parsonage, and we were outside trying to plug up these couple of leaks in the roof. And Simeon would come, he would go in to do a meeting and come out and just talk with us, go inside and check on his kids, come out and talk to us. And it's because Simeon wanted to come out and get to know Gramer and was asking Gramer about his life and his work and everything that brought him up to this point, that this story emerged, that Gramer was preaching to the DS. And it's only because of all that sequence of events 
all of that just going out and trying to be the people of God, taking care of each other, that this not only happened, but impacted Reverend Law so much that he carried that story with him and brought it to the Joint Charge Conference to bless all of us with, to bless everyone with. And I did not know he was going to do that. I was surprised. And this is kind of where I'm going with this, is that whether it's holy conferencing or doing the work of the church outside of these walls, when we step out and make connections with each other, with people in the community, with other people from the other churches, when we share our stories with each other, when we really try to get to know each other, these moments can emerge that have an effect that goes beyond anything that we could expect. It's a surprise. And to me, that's the posture of Advent. During Advent, which is the term we just made, this is the first Sunday in Advent. Advent is about expectation, anticipation. And part of that is the anticipation of the coming of the King, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is coming. But also Jesus is already here. We trust that the Holy Spirit is among us. And so what I would propose to you, especially looking at our scripture passage this morning from Mark, right? Verse 32, but about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. No one, no, did, did you get, even Jesus doesn't know when Jesus is coming back. That's a little, had you ever thought about that? That's what Mark is saying is Jesus doesn't even know when Jesus is coming back. It's going to be a surprise. You and I are going to be surprised. Christ is going to be surprised. And so what is it that we're expecting? We're expecting to be surprised. We're living out in a faithful posture of expectation. We're going out and doing that work. We're making those connections. We're living into the kingdom now, already. Not because we are expecting a specific thing to happen. We didn't go and take care of the DS's roof and share our stories because we were expecting something to happen. And maybe nothing would happen. But because of Gramer's faithfulness and his willingness to preach his life <laughs> and give this anecdote, it became a blessing to the whole region. And so that's kind of all I got to say, right? Is that during this Advent season, I hope that we would reconnect with each other be present with each other, build our relationships, because that's what the kingdom of God is all about. And we do it not because we are expecting a specific return or a specific goal, but in fact, because we're expecting to be surprised. And that sounds like the gospel to me, and it also sounds like faithful discipleship, living in a way that we expect to be surprised.